The Perfect Knife for the Perfect Life by R.J. Ehlert The wind whipped through the clearing, rustling the fallen leaves, and a voice spoke through it. It is not enough. Many hours later, Jane Harper asked, Did you have any luck finding? She cut her sentence short as her son, Aiden, ran through the kitchen making growling and moaning noises with very realistic paint, making him look like a zombie. Aiden came up to his mother and pretended to bite her arm. She affected a good-natured shriek, which satisfied the six-year-old, but internally she recoiled at the gory, violent monster that her son dressed as. Jordan Harper picked up a meat tenderizer from the counter and boomed out, Smash the zombie! Crush its skull in! He swung the instrument with no intention to hit, but still came far too close to Aiden's head, before the boy ran off mixing giggles with high-pitched growls. Jane hissed, That was too close, Jordan! He smiled while moving the metal head in front of her face. I never would have hit him. Jane asked, What if he moved toward you? Jordan's smile slipped, and he put the tool back on the counter. Jane resumed her earlier question in a hushed voice. Have you found Duke? Jordan ran a hand through his hair and looked around. No, Duchess is in the yard, but I didn't find how Duke got out of the fence. The kids haven't noticed yet. Do you think it's possible that one of them let him out and didn't tell us? Jane shook her head. It was probably Mia. Jordan's expression turned sour. I doubt it. She's too responsible for that. Why are you always ragging on her? Jane answered. Her cooking is subpar, her cleaning is mediocre, and certain eyes watch her far too much. Jordan smirked. Come on, you know I only have eyes for you. Let's ask the kids if they know where Duke is. Jane said, I don't want to upset them before they go trick-or-treating. They love it. Must be something they get from you. Jordan said, They're too attached to dogs. Must be something they get from you. He sighed, then asked, So, what do you suggest we do? Jane ignored his first comment and said, I'll call my sister and ask her to take the kids without us. We'll look for Duke around the neighborhood. Jordan looked off into the distance for a long moment, then said, all right. You know, if he ran off anywhere, he's probably at Gringon Park. They always run off into the woods whenever we take them there, chasing the smell of deer. Jane said, that's as good a place as any to start. The couple dropped their kids off at the Becker household, where they compared costumes with their cousins. After that, they made the short drive to Gringon Park. Jane had suggested they bring Duchess, but Jordan said that he didn't want to have to chase two dogs through the woods. Jordan led the way through Grignon Park's deep woods, calling out Duke's name. Jane noticed how his path seemed purposeful as soon as they got out of the car. It was as if he had a destination in mind, rather than just a random search. By the time they made it to the clearing, the sun had melded with the horizon, turning the sky into a dimly luminous bruise. In the middle of the clearing, among the brown and red fallen leaves was a circle of stones. In the middle of the stone circle was the body of a black German shepherd. Jane ran up, but then stopped five feet short of the stone circle and gasped. Jordan's face became rigid and he took long, purposeful strides. He looked at Jane, then moved past her and knelt down. The fur around the dog's neck was sticky, but dry, and a shiny dark substance coated the leaves and ground around him. He reached out and turned the dog tag to the sky just to be sure that it said Duke. He asked, What the hell happened? Suddenly, a sharp pain blossomed in his back, traveling deep into his meat, slicing across his waist bumping into and moving around his spine, then completing its journey up his other side. Jordan, shock-making thought almost impossible, 
flopped down on top of his wife's dog. He managed to turn over and saw as Jane brought down a huge, stylized, curved knife and slashed his belly open. The laceration was deep enough that the abdomen muscles gave out, causing him to lay back prone on the dead animal. Jordan let out a throat-tearing scream, but then the pain drained out of him, and he saw the world in a disjointed blur. He looked up at his wife, even as the warm life of his body flowed out around him. In the twilight, he could see tears on her face and a quivering chin. He breathed out, Why? Jane looked for a long moment at the bloody knife in her hand, guard and pommel curving into points over her first and last fingers, short horn spikes on either side of the blade. The metal had strange symbols etched into it, after staring at the weapon, Jane wiped away her tears and her expression. She said, I had to, Jor. I had to. I can't stop. I can't ever stop. At first it could just be a thing. I cut apart my mother's wedding dress. She left it to me hoping I'd find love, and I loved it. I cut apart the dress, and I got you. When you even noticed me in high school, all you did was make fun of me. Publicly announcing that the only time I took my nose out of a book was to stare at you. When my mother died, I didn't just get her dress, but also things her grandfather left her. Odd things he brought back with him from Tunisia. I had to learn Phoenician to understand what was written on this blade. Find out what it was? Figure out how to make it work. It was crafted by a priest of Karnayam Haman, anointed in the blood of the priest's own son. Although, it only worked if the priest loved his child. When I cut up my mother's wedding dress, I won the lottery. You suddenly fell in love with me. We found a great place to live. You used my winnings to start up a business, hired all the right people, made all the right investments, and we were set for life. My pregnancy with Aiden was medically perfect. A wedding dress from my mother, my security blanket, and finally, the journals I kept for ten years. After that, we were so rich, had so many things, that I just couldn't love an object anymore. None of the things I destroyed that Halloween would do it. They weren't enough. Halfway into November, you got arrested for insider trading. Your company had to file for bankruptcy, and I had to live with my sister. My father's cancer came back. They said I had the precursors of cancer, too. That changed the following year. My father went missing that Halloween, and everyone thought that he committed suicide. Within a month, you were cleared of all charges. Your company and its patents were bought up. We were rich again. You were hired as a consultant in the merger, and I was pregnant again, with no sign of any illness. The next year, I had to make sure it was something I loved. Bailey was a really great dog, the first thing that we had together. In some ways, it was even harder than my father. Dad was dying, slow, painfully. I think it was worse because he was in my life and I didn't please Carnium Haman that year. It was my fault. At least the morphine made it so he didn't know what was happening. Couldn't feel it. Bailey, she made the worst noise. She looked at me with frantic eyes. She wanted me to make it better. That's why I cut Duke's throat. Faster that way. But... Turns out that planning to kill your dog for a year really makes it hard to love him. It wasn't enough. Jane could see that Jordan's eyes were glazing over. She wasn't even sure that he could still hear her. Looking at that handsome face, one she had never expected to see this way. Her chest tightened with so much pain that she doubled over and retched. In six years, she had never told a soul about this. There was something cathartic in saying it all out loud, even if it was to a dying man. She said, I love you, Jordan. 
I love you. I love you. I'll make sure our kids are taken care of. Your parents and your brother too. This was a mistake. I never wanted it to be you. I'll make sure I know for sure what will work next year. I promise. Jane could see that her husband no longer breathed. She gently closed his eyelids. The wind whipped through the clearing, rustling the fallen leaves, and a voice spoke through it. It is enough. The End <laughs>